What's going on, guys? Thanks for tuning in. Thank you for joining us for today's show where we interview Sari Cooper, who is the founder and director of the Center for Love and Sex in New York City. It's a private therapy and coaching group where she coaches individuals and couples. And Sari is a certified sex therapist and has been in private practice for over 25 years. And today we talk about sex esteem and building eroticism in your relationship and particularly during these stressful times, but really you can apply them hopefully sooner rather than later when <laughs> things are getting quote unquote back to normal, whatever that is. But it is important all the time to be working on these things in your relationship and understanding yourself, what turns you on, being able to communicate that with your partner. And we really talk about fun ways to be able to do that. And if you've got some extra time on your hands, there's no pressure. And that's something Sari says. It's like, there's enough pressure and anxiety right now. But if you're feeling like you're in a good place, and she talks about ways to get to a better place with anxiety, then these are some great things to be working on in your relationship. Yeah, and we are really thankful for Sari and her advice today and for the help that she did in uh, contributing to our Love Under Quarantine series. All of the therapists donated their time to create many talks really dedicated toward helping couples during this specific time of quarantine and stress and uncertainty. And so we really appreciate her donating her time to help us and you guys with that. Um, you can check out that series. We'll put the links in the show notes as well as it's on our website. Yeah, it's a podcast series that will, we think, really help you guys. And that's what we're really here to do is get the advice along with you. And we appreciate you guys tuning in. As always, subscribing to the show, telling your friends and family. You can be like, look, we know you guys have a little extra time. Check this out. Working on your relationship and helping improve yourself is really one of the best things that we can be doing. And I don't want to say that in the sense of like, you need to be doing that because as Siri kind of says, like, especially now there's enough pressure going on uh, in our lives and we don't need the added pressure of thinking we always need to be improving our relationship. But if you're into that, we're here for you. And uh, yeah, we appreciate you guys. Enjoy the show. Today's show is brought to you by our online course, Spark My Relationship. Create more passion, improve your communication, and build a stronger, more intimate connection with your partner in less than 90 days. We've collaborated with 15 therapists and psychologists to bring you the strategies marriage therapists teach their clients. To unlock a special offer only for I Do Podcast listeners, visit sparkmyrelationship.com slash unlock. That's sparkmyrelationship.com slash unlock. Hi, Sari. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Sari, today we're going to talk about sex esteem in the time of corona or COVID-19, whichever way you're referring to it these days. But obviously, it has just completely altered everyone's lives and it's affecting relationships big time. And how are you seeing the effects of this virus on people's relationships when it comes to sexuality? So what we see at my center, I have a center for um, sex therapy called Center for Love and Sex here in New York City, and we're doing teletherapy during this time. But what uh, we're seeing the most of are people's anxiety um, increase so much that um, they're, they, they're having sex less frequently. Um, they're having trouble sort of finding a way back to an erotic place. Um, both for themselves and with their partner. For sure. And yeah. I've noticed just the anxiety. Like I'm not even, obviously New York City, like a, what an epicenter for this thing. And we're fortunate to be in Costa Rica where there's not a lot of cases, but just reading the news and and just the uncertainty of everything, definitely a lot of anxiety, which 
it's not going to make you want to jump into bed. Um, so, so how are you guiding people through that? So the first thing I think we have to do is normalize it, right? Because people feel terrible about themselves. And I always talk about the Buddhist notion of the two arrows, meaning uh, the first arrow is a fact, whether it's um, pain in your back or um, the limitation of, uh, you know, how we can't see one another. Um, Those are facts, right? And the coronavirus is a fact, But the second arrow is the ruminations or narrative or stories that we tell about the fact. And that's where a lot of, that's where the distress comes from, right? And so that's where a lot of the anxiety is coming from. So the the first thing I do is kind of normalize it. Like, look, we are all in this together. Like this, you know, we haven't had a situation like this in New York where both our clients and the therapists are actually going through the same situation. simultaneously since, uh, I would say nine 11. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I was practicing during nine 11. And so there was the issue of like making sure your whole, you know, your family is safe and all of that while you're also taking care of people who are also concerned uh, about their well being and safety. And do we stay in New York? Right. And that's, what's going on a lot right now in New York are people thinking, well, should I stay here, right? Should Is this a place I want to continue to live? Um, so, so, so the first thing I do is just kind of normalize it. We are all in this together. And I know that's become kind of a mantra um, for coronavirus stay at home um, time. But I, I, I do believe it's very true. So the first thing is you want to make people feel like we are all in this together. We are all going through uh, different points of anxiety around the unknowing of how long this will last, right? So that's kind of the first step. Let's talk about that just for a second because that seems like one of the biggest mm, <laughs> things yeah. is like just the uncertainty around how long this will last and then everyone's like we'll get back to normal. It's like, well, what if what is normal? Like and we we just don't know and you you read the stuff and definitely separating fact from the stories we tell about the fact is, is helpful to me. I, I, and I think that's a helpful exercise, but how about just like that uncertainty of like a month from now, two months, six months from now, um, how are you helping people with that? Um, so one of the techniques that I use pretty much with most of our clients, um, is a mindfulness based practice. And why I use that is it really does help people stay in the present moment and not look out too far in the future. And I think different people individually have a different uh, capacity to look out, uh, you know, in the future at different time frames. And so you have to know yourself well enough to know, well, how far in the future do I want to plan or uh even contemplate. And and that's a very personal thing. So I can't tell people what to do, but I can help them check in with themselves, if you will. And how might they do that by, you know, staying present? So you won't tell them like, hey, maybe don't think so much about what you're going to be doing in December. Well, what I do is allow them to, you know, I use a technique of taking one's temperature uh, when it comes to emotions like anxiety or anger, or frustration. And so what I say to people is, you know, right now, where are you on a scale of zero to 10 as far as anxiety goes? Can you bring your mind's eye internally, take some breaths, and tell me where you're at right this moment? And people can actually access that. They'll say, well, I think I'm at about a six. And I'll say, well, a six is pretty high. And anything above a five you are creeping up there. And we also know in psychology and psychotherapy that uh, time speeds up between the numbers seven, eight, and then 10. Uh, and it doesn't uh, go at an evenly paced uh, rhythm. And so what we want to do is help people lower their stress down to a two or three where it's manageable to access their, what we call the frontal lobe, where reason, planning, decisive, logical thinking takes place. So what I do is I help them develop 
mindfulness-based stress reduction practice. And do you see when people go from a six to a two that their sex life significantly improves or the ability to relax and enjoy their partner sexually gets easier? It normally does. I think during this time, there's a a kind of a bittersweet twist to what we're all experiencing, which is that there's a a lot less space um, between ourselves and our partners. And what I mean by that is not only physical space, but emotional bandwidth space. So given that you're, you know, rooming together, um, you're working together, you're caretaking together um, 24-7, there isn't that kind of distance of like, oh, I miss you, or I was dreaming about you, or, you know, I was thinking about that time. No, we're 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 right there in each other's spaces. And, um, you know, my colleague Esther Perel, who wrote the book Mating in Captivity, writes uh, that you know how can we want what we already have, right? When it's right in front of us, twenty four seven. Well, this is the best example of captivity Mm -hmm. I could even have ever imagined, right? So how do you create a spark again when you're living, you know, 24-7 with your partner? So how do we do it? How how can our (laughs) listeners work on igniting that spark? So what I always say to people is, can you find little mini uh, vacations? for yourself, first of all, to do some self-care, to to meditate and ground yourself, and to maybe uh, give yourself an erotic inspiration. So whether your um, erotic inspiration is uh, through a visual stimulus, whether it's through an audio stimulus, uh, whether it's a tactile stimulus, one of the elements of the of sex esteem, which is the model that I coined way back when, um, is using um, the five senses and adding two more to really uh, expand your uh, toolkit. And so people have to know what their primary erotic um, triggers are. You know, people use the term trigger as a negative thing, but I also use it as a positive thing. Can you explain what a primary erotic trigger is? So what I say to people, and I, I actually have a channel on YouTube also called Sex Esteem, Sari with, uh, Sex Esteem with Sari Cooper. And there's an episode devoted to um, erotic triggers. So I say to people, look, you have your five senses, and then you have um, your psychological trigger and your emotional trigger. And why I divide those up is that even though they are sometimes overlapping, sometimes people, their primary erotic trigger is power exchange, right? They really get turned on by either submitting to a partner, um, imagining submitting to a partner, right? There's the fantasy element and then there's the enactment or uh, dominating or taking control or leading the action. And for some people, they go back and forth, right? They kind of fluid. They they like to take turns. And some people are kind of lean more to one side of that um, scale, if you will. And then for the emotional trigger, I think about intimacy, um, right? And it's usually closeness and uh, something loving that your partner does or that you do for them or that they appreciate. Um, it's a romantic gesture. And for some people, that's their kind of primary trigger. And it's really important to have without it, they can't kind of enter um, the zone, if you will. Um, so a lot of times, pe- partners, you know, they think they know, and sometimes they're pretty accurate, but a lot of times they don't know the top three. And it's really important to enter your partner's playground, right? Not to say, well, I like it this way, so this is the way we're going to do it every time. No, if that's not your partner's erotic play space, um, it's going to start to feel uh, one-sided, maybe a little unfair, if you will, um, if it's only one way. So I, I ask people to really kind of look, do a, d- a deep dive and, and find out for them what it is. How 
would they be able to start finding that out for themselves and then sharing it with their partner or getting their partner to look within and because that's a key, right? It's understanding for yourself, but then sharing that with your partner and working together to best uh, accommodate each other? Correct. Yeah. So part of the sex esteem model, it has to do with really calm communication. And I think that people get very riled up um, or hurt or frustrated um, when they begin to hear uh, from their partner things that the partner doesn't like. And, um, and for partners who have been together for some time, in some ways it can be even more painful to hear that for you know, years the partner has not liked, let's say, the way the, their partner has um, given them oral sex or um, the positions that uh, they've had intercourse in or um, the way that uh, someone else has kind of rimmed them. I mean, these are like very intimate experiences and people feel like, well, I can't tell them now. They're going to feel like, why didn't you tell me earlier? And I'll feel so embarrassed. So part of having sex esteem is having the calm and confidence to articulate what it is that you want in a kind of sexy, erotic fashion. And to have these kinds of conversations in an environment or context that is uh, less fraught, right? Both people are calmer and connected. Yeah, I can imagine that if a couple has not had these conversations before, they they might feel uncomfortable or vulnerable, especially if sexuality or talking about sexuality was not part of their growing up, their childhood or their family dynamic. Exactly. And, you know, as a sex therapist, I'm an ASIC certified sex therapist. And one of the things that... Um, sex therapists do is they do a sexual history. So even if I'm seeing a couple, you know, we see couples and individuals at CLS, but even if a couple comes in together, um, I take time and my therapists take time to do individual history taking with each person where we actually uh, go through each stage of development, including relationships earlier in childhood you know, relationships before this one and childhood experiences to find out how and what they learned about sexuality. And most people don't have a good uh, framework of sex education, whether it's in their family of origin or through their friends or at school. It's very limited. It sure is. And and that's why... We love to be able to give this information to get people even thinking about it because just just the exercise of going, huh, what what do I like <laughs> is a lot of times, I mean, I know personally, it wasn't something that I even stopped to consciously really think about, let alone communicate with my partner. Before we continue on, we're going to take a short break to tell you about our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. We've been telling you guys about BetterHelp and online therapy for a while now, and we love working with BetterHelp. And now more than ever feels like a time that we need to talk to someone. And the uncertainty with everything going on in the world can just add a lot of stress. And even before this time, Sarah and I were seeing an online therapist through BetterHelp and individually and as a couple and just found a ton of benefits. And now it's really showing its benefit. BetterHelp connects you with a professional counselor in a safe and private online environment. You can communicate with your therapist via text, chat, phone, and video. And you can choose from over 3,000 U.S. licensed therapists across all 50 states who specialize in relationships, depression, stress, anxiety, trauma, and many more areas. And of course, anything you share is confidential. And if you're not happy with your counselor for any reason, you can request a new one at any time for no additional charge. BetterHelp is secure, convenient, and professional. 
We want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash I do. Join over 800,000 people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash I do for 10% off your first month. Today's episode is also brought to you by Uberlube. Lube is the key to maximizing pleasure, whether you're alone or with your partner. So if you don't know, now you know. And <laughs> if you're going to lubricate, you want to make sure it's done with the highest quality body safe ingredients and nothing beats Uber Lube. Uber Lube truly is for everyone. Thousands of doctors recommend Uber Lube as their go-to solution for patients experiencing dryness. Uber Lube's simple ingredients list makes it widely used by people with sensitivities to other lubricants. And people can use Uber Lube outside of the bedroom for hair control, like for frizziness, for chafing for those athletes, for massages, and so much more. And Uber Lube lets your skin feel like skin. Lube is supposed to enhance touch, not to overpower it. So Uber Lube adds a thin layer that leads to just the right amount of slip while still allowing for skin-to-skin -skin sensations. And for those of you that can't see in the dark, <laughs> which is probably all of you, unless you're Spider-Man and you're listening, or Batman. Or Batman, Cat Eye Vision. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Uber Lube's measured pumps allow you to dispense the perfect amount of product every time, even in the dark. So right now they're offering ID Podcast listeners a special offer, 10% off and free shipping when you use our code I do at uberlube.com. That's 10% off and free shipping. Use the code I do at uberlube.com. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think that um, in heterosexual relationships, actually, the research shows also um, that women are not having orgasms as frequently as their male partners, right? This, is, this has been in the news a lot lately in, in my neck of the woods in terms of my field. And the question is why? Why is it that in you know, the last few you know, experiences women are not orgasming in heterosexual relationships. And a part of that is that sex esteem that they don't have, right? That sense of entitlement to figure out what is it that I like that makes me really turned on and aroused? And what is it that I need to orgasm? And how am I going to tell that to a partner, whether they're um, a hookup partner, um, someone I've been dating for a few months to a more committed long-term partner? So let's talk a little bit about eroticism and you mentioned the saying of like how can I want what I already have and now more than ever that's going to be harder for couples stuck at home there's less separation certainly less eroticism with the stress are there some specific tools we can do during these times or you know hopefully when things get back to normal but but especially now with, with people at home and, and added stress to create more eroticism? Yes, I think that um, what people tend to stop using um, is their imaginations and their playfulness. And so one of the things I say to people all the time is, how did you, pl do you remember a time when you were a child that you used to play um, whether it was playing uh, Martians and Earth people or um, playing house or playing, you know, just, you know, imagination playing. Uh, do you remember a time when you did that? How old were you? And then I'll say, and usually this time, just developmentally, is before people, kids start, you know, any sort of organized sports you know, if they, if they get involved in it or just playing sports in the, in the streets, whatever, where the, the goal really is to win, right? So there's a period of development where kids play and they play seriously uh, for the sheer delight of playing and they're not going to know where it's going to go. And so I try to get people to get back into that kind of a headspace and uh, view of sexuality and eroticism. Interesting. So 
let's dive into that a little because I I like that idea of playing without knowing where it's gonna go and obviously in, in an erotic sense but yeah as adults we kind of lose that we get into the headspace that like there has to be an agenda and mm-hmm. and there has to be a specific outcome or at least it's the way I think about it and we're not playing as much so how can we cultivate that in the erotic sense so you set up guidelines initially, right? Which is what kids do when they play, by the way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They'll say, you know, we're going to play in this area of the playground. Um, you know, when you hit the wall, the fence over there, you're not, you're not involved in play anymore, right? They set up rules and it's, they're very serious about them. So in the same way, you can set up um, boundaries about what you're willing to do, activities you're willing to do. Um, what areas you're going to cover in your uh, apartment or bedroom. Um, and and then kind of your bottom line things of like, I don't think I want to do this tonight, but I'd, I'd be open for this. Um, and those are really important kind of guidelines because it doesn't, it doesn't say we're, we're going to actually do, you know, soup to nuts. Right. And I always talk about a sexual menu, just like when, we all used to go out for dinner sometimes <laughs> um, back pre-COVID. Um, sometimes we were in the mood for like a soup and a salad. And sometimes we were in the mood for just, um, you know, an entree. And sometimes we just wanted to have a dessert. And, and I think that um, it's important for people to communicate what they're open to, um, so, to set expectations properly. And then... Obviously, within all that, there's like a huge range of where we can go with our imagination. But I'm thinking things like primarily role playing. Is there something I'm missing here? Like what are, what are some other – can you maybe talk a little bit about that or some other ways that we can well, take this? Well, role playing is great the most um, akin to kind of playing house, if you will, or make believe when you were younger. And certainly that can be – it can be really erotic for people and people have different uh, ways of enacting that. And people feel like, Oh, I'm not good at acting. And, and that's not the notion, right? Cause that's the performative piece that gets people really hung up. Um, mm-hmm. You're not supposed to be the best actor or actress. You're not supposed to always orgasm when you have a sexual scenario uh, that would be goal oriented, right? It's uh, let's just try something. You know, and and so enactment of a role or a power role, right, can be really enhancing. Um, watching something together, um, you know, uh, try. You know, one of the things that a lot of people feel awkward about is even masturbating in front of each other. It, it, it you know, it's ingrained in us for so long that masturbation is a private affair, if you will. Um, that even the notion of masturbating in front of one another seems, um, awkward, just, you know, like I can do that or, you know, I, would feel so self-conscious or, right. And we we're also bumping into years of negative body image, especially for women, but I, I've encountered it with men as well, whether they be straight, queer, um, you know, gay. And, and, and I think that, um, one has to feel more, uh, empowered to be able to be watched, if you will, right? Because that's a, a, a sort of a power exchange, role play, um, erotic game as well. What advice would you give to the individual that their awkwardness or the feelings that they feel when doing these types of things is what's preventing them from from trying? What advice could you give to them just to kind of open up and just just give it a try? And it may not be as bad as you think it will be. Right. So just like in phobias where we do desensitization, um, we have people make a list of the things that the most, you know, most fearful um, uh, experience to the, the one that causes maybe a, a minimal amount of distress. We make, we encourage them to make their own list, right? Their own sort of arc. And we'll start with a smaller one and we'll, we'll say, can you try this with a partner um, and use your mindfulness meditation skills to keep yourself grounded um, and then 
come back into a session and talk about it and see what came up for you and slowly expand what we call in sex therapy, a sexual script. And that is the way you grow your sex esteem. What's a way that a partner can bring this up with their significant other? That might just be intimidating and for fear of being shot down or laughed at or, um, you know, how can, how can they start this conversation of like, hey, I want to work on this and explore this with you? So certainly a, a podcast like this to say, mm-hmm. you know, I heard this podcast and they were talking about different elements of sexuality that I think would be really cool to like try out. Um, would you want to listen to it with me? Just the, just the notion of listening to it, right? Where you're not saying anything yet. You're letting kind of the information um, be imported and settled and processed. And then asking, you know, was, is there something there that you've like thought about before? That's a great starter. And it seems like now, hopefully when this airs, things will potentially be loosening up and people are going out more, but it might be a while before things are quote unquote back to normal, whatever that is, but we're Mm -hmm. spending a lot of time at home, maybe working from home for the next year, who knows, but, but this could be to me, exciting, like, oh, we have this extra time to explore these things, but it can also add like a, a level of pressure mm-hmm. of like, now we're home more, we, we should have sex more. I, I think I read that online was like, that was something maybe in our Love Tribe Facebook group that there was like pressure because we're spending more time together. And it's like, oh, it doesn't really work that way. So what do you think in in relation to that? I know there's things are in flux, but how we can think about doing these things under these circumstances. So I think um, the shoulds have to go out the window. They're really uh, sort of anti-erotic. I think asking to set up sex dates to uh, as play dates um, puts a whole different frame on it. And I think I, I should mention also that, you know, there are a lot of shoulds that are being put upon parents right now. We haven't really spoken about that. But couples who are um, juggling, uh, working from home, uh, taking care of the home, cooking, (laughs) taking care of their kids. And if they're school age kids, you know, providing um, oversight to uh, schooling or doing this, teaching themselves. I mean, it's so many layers of responsibility that it's no wonder that people are really fatigued. So I want to give a huge sort of shout out to the parents out there. Like (laughs) I do not think you should add or do anything. Um, I'm offering this as an invitation to kind of um, a fun uh, way of relaxing together. And so whether that is like a little, uh, time in the shower spent together. You know, when was the last time you took a shower together? Um, before you go to bed or um, doing a Tantra breathing exercise together um, on the floor as a way of winding down together and connecting emotionally as well as tactile. Um, so I, I, I want to sort of make sure that we cover that because I think parents are just getting like slammed with advice. And I am not in that business. I, I, I think I, my hat's off to people with younger kids in the house. It's, it is uh, really tough for them. And so I think about this as kind of a mini break, a mini vacation, not a should, but what would you find pleasurable in this moment? That's a great perspective to have now and anytime really like the, the shoulds going out the window. Like to me, that ties into expectations and whenever we bring too high of expectations into any situation, but certainly sexual one with our partner, it can just load the whole situation and create some negative effects. So Sari, thank you for all of this great information that hopefully our listeners will be able to apply now and and going forward. Are there any things that we missed out that you want to maybe bring up or emphasize a point that we went over before we say goodbye? Right. I would think you would have a lot of compassion for one another so that if one person initiates, do not get initiation fatigue. If someone initiates, one partner initiates, 
the other partner, first of all, experience it as a gift. Like, thank you so much. I'm so glad you're still looking at me in the, as an erotic partner, as a sexual um, uh, loving person. Um, I, I may not be up for everything tonight or this morning. Can we try another time and I'll make a date and then I will follow up with you? So there's this kind of um, ping pong analogy of going back and forth. So uh, the one person isn't always the one initiating because that does get, ex- you know, really exhausting for one partner to hold on to that. And um, yeah, and I think that uh, I'd love for people to follow me. I'm on Instagram at uh, Sari Cooper Sex Esteem. And as I said, I have a center called uh, centerforloveandsex.com where we're doing teletherapy. And you can also follow me on Facebook at Sari Cooper. Um, it's I think it's at a Center for Love and Sex. Yeah. Perfect. Well, we'll have those links to all your social media and website on the show notes page and on our website at idpodcast.com. So everybody knows they can go there and be able to contact you. And thanks again for joining us on the show and, and again for helping us with our podcast series, Love Under Quarantine. And it's helped a lot of people during this time. And we really appreciate you taking the time to help us and our listeners right now. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I think what you're doing is wonderful. Thanks so much for listening to today's show. As always, all the links are in the podcast description and on our website. So if you are dying to check out our new podcast series, Love Under Quarantine, you can click those links in the episode description and get access immediately. The podcast series is now available and we hope you guys check it out. And as well, there are always free resources on our website at idpodcast.com, freebies, all different types of topics. So check out our website and we hope you guys enjoyed the show. 